<clears throat> True or false? The Knicks are still up in the series. True or false? <laughs> That's the good thing about winning two games at home. You got the advantage going on the road. That's the uh, that's the positive spin. The negative spin is they could very well be tied on Sunday. Because I didn't like a lot of the things I saw. Um, to bush it into one, one thing in particular, we're, we're going to focus on that. And then we'll talk some positive, because there was a positive in this game. Um, let's do it. Knicks, Sixers, Game 3, in White Trash Philly, Episode 672. Welcome to the podcast. Let's go. Welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, RJ Carbone. You are listening to BD4, where there's no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA. Yanks every series, Knicks every game, MMA on occasion. Let's get to it. Anthony for three. Positive spin is that they're still up two two to one. Um, that is the wrong one second here. Sorry, I had the wrong graphic up on the screen. If you're watching, um, yeah, two to one, the Knicks are winning the series. So that's the good thing. Um, bad thing is hopefully Mitchell Robinson's good to play for Game Four. I don't think he will be um, because, well. Joel Embiid, who was, I still can't get over the fact that the dude was crying in the post game, <laughs> game fucking three, a grown man crying after a playoff loss. Um, just funny. The, the same guy, you know, part of the same team who them and their, you know, trashy fan base was bitching and complaining about the Knicks being a little too physical because Tyrese Maxey got tickled towards the end of game three or game two, they're now backing. I swear, I shit you not, look at every Philadelphia Sixers fan page or content creator. Those white trash scums are now backing Joel Embiid for playing dirty. Um, I repeat, this is the same organization, players, fan base, who were crying when Tyrese Maxey got tickled at the end of Game 2, they're now backing Joel Embiid for flailing his arms and kicking his legs and pulling down Mitchell Robinson. Like, they're they're backing him for being a little dirty. And my whole thing has been, you know what, get muddy. I've been saying this for the Knicks because I think you got to be the first one to do it. So now the Knicks have to respond to that dirt with dirt. You want to open up that floodgate? We can do it. We're the most physical team in the NBA. So I, you know, my, my hope, I don't think it's going to happen, but my hope is that for game four, the Knicks come out the gate with like Jericho Sims or Charlie Brown or Daquan Jeffries, one of them in the game, and they just like go right for that crybaby's kneecaps. You know, let's let's just put an end to it. You want to keep playing that game, we'll play it. That'd be nice. You know, a little... uh little rough and tough there but um probably not going to happen but I, I, w- I would expect the Knicks to be super physical coming out the gate in game three game four I'm all fucked um but this is going to be hopefully a um an episode where we cover everything we need to but it's I'm going to try to keep it short 
I have a busy day. It is now the night after the day after Friday, April 26, as this is being recorded and probably released tonight. Um, so yeah, Joel Embiid got a little dirty. Um, scumbag player, scumbag fan base, scumbag organization. We all know this. You know, Philadelphia is literal white trash, and um, I, I always like. It's like saying a prayer at night. I go to bed and I watch Bill Burr's rant every night. I swear to I swear to God, I watch that shit almost nightly. Um, it's it's beautiful, and uh, I thought of that right away when uh, you know Mitchell Robinson left the game. That was the first thing I thought of was wow, Bill Burr was right. Um, let's talk about the game itself. I mean, yeah, like there are a number of reviews and flagrants in the first quarter, you know, uh, but the good thing to see was that Brunson got off to a very hot start. Um, and he was good throughout the game. Uh, he, he got off to a good start, and the Knicks were playing a very solid half of basketball. They looked very good. They were up at the half. Second half comes, and you had from the Knicks about as bad as an opening to a half that you could have. Uh, they let MB get going because he wasn't ejected, and it wasn't a flagrant two because the Zebras, you know, are paying back Philly from the tickle fest at the end of game two. So Embiid stays in the game and he goes off in the third quarter, you know, and eventually it's just, it's too little too late. Uh, I, I didn't like some of the fourth quarter minutes that we got from Jalen Brunson. I thought he was being hunted defensively in the third come the fourth quarter. He kind of went away from his offense from what worked in this game for him. Um, didn't like how he was isolating onto length. Uh, and the Knicks eventually lose 125 to 114. And B drops 50 with the help of some zebras and more free throws than, than the Knicks' entire team by a wide margin. And Brunson finishes with 39 points. That was the story. The Embiid 50. Because the Knicks defense, listen, as, as much as we want to sit here and complain about Joel Embiid being the scumbag, dirty player he is, and he is. The Knicks' defense was bad. Play better defense, right? And the third quarter, that was the game right there. They have a third quarter where they allow Philly to score 33 and not 43. They probably win that game. But Philly drops 43 points in the period. They shoot 77% from the field. They knock down 9 of 12 from 3. And like I said, you had Jalen Brunson just being hunted. You know, the Sixers were forcing Brunson into multiple actions. They had Lowry come up to screen to get Brunson into the action. You know, if the Knicks played it well, Philly would go to a counter. Like, there was a possession early in the second half. I thought the Knicks did a nice job shutting down a Chicago action, a Zoom action. But then Philly countered that by bringing Lowry into the action to screen so they could get the Brunson switch. Eventually... You know, Dante DiVincenzo, I don't know if it was his decision or if it was Tom Thibodeau's decision, but eventually it was enough. And DiVincenzo was like, fuck this. Let me push Brunson away. I'll take on Lowry. I'll guard at the point of attack. And it didn't work as it didn't work much better, but yeah, Brunson was abominable defensively. Uh, they were getting him through stagger sets on switches, and Bede was just finding him on every switch he could. Early in the third quarter, I think one of the first possessions, Embiid knocks down an elbow jumper, or I think it was a jumper at the nail over Jalen Brunson. Basically an open look. Um, the Knicks were switching those Maxi Lowry pick and rolls a little too much. You know, I just didn't like the amount of switches that Brunson ended up on. He was getting beat off ball too. You know, that baseline out of bounds set in the middle of the third quarter. Brunson loses Kyle Lowry on the back cut. You can't, like, the, the, the sole purpose on a blob set is to take away the paint. You have to focus on protecting the inside of the paint because the inbounder is on the baseline. Brunson loses track of Lowry. Lowry gets an easy look at the, at the, at the, at the, at the rim. You had Isaiah Hartenstein. He had some good contests. You know, a lot of it was a lot of tough shot making by uh, scumbag Joel. But 
you know, a couple times where iHeart was beat in drop coverage late coming up, a couple times where he had to overhelp, you know. Um, yeah, like the middle of the third quarter possession where Tyrese Maxey's coming off a screen going downhill. Hartenstein's backtracking and drop. That leaves Embiid open for an elbow jumper. There were multiple times where Hartenstein had to overhelp on the ball, and I'm not blaming him, and then that screwed things up in rotation. Josh Hart, same thing. He had to overhelp at the nail. It led to open looks for Philly. And that's that's gravity. That's that's the tough part of having Maxi and Embiid share the floor together. Both of them contain a lot of gravity. They, they have what I call gravitational pull. Their two-man game is elite because they both have the ability to screw up a defense. They both force the Knicks in rotation off of the help, and that leads to open looks. The entire third quarter, Maxi going downhill, and B pops to the three-point line. Two are on the ball, gravity. And now the slot man, who's one pass over, has to decide, are the Knicks going to switch or should I hedge? If the, Nick, if the Knicks switch it, now they're in a mismatch. If you decide to hedge it, now you got to bank on recovering quick enough. That's going to be the storyline of Game 4 defensively, in my opinion. If the Knicks can't figure out how they're going to work those actions... They're toast. Toast. Um, you had Tyrese Maxey even killing Deuce McBride, who's, you know, their best point of attack defensive player. He was killing him late third, early early fourth. And Bede was just getting whatever he wanted, though, in the third quarter. Obviously, he got some love, love from his zebras. Allowed to play a little more physical, but, you know, undisciplined defense from the Knicks. That's part of it. You know, like I said, the fact that the Knicks were in some drop coverage, I, I didn't love that. I mentioned in the series preview, I worry about the pick and pop because the Knicks play in a drop a lot. Play at the level. I would risk, like, rely on your backline help. Come to the level, rely on your help from, you know, def- rely on the backline help to stop Maxi coming off pick and roll getting downhill. Because the last thing you want to your your focus should be on Embiid taking away his office. If you if you allow Embiid into his office on the elbow, what goal are you accomplishing defensively? So I think the Knicks should play up on those pick and pops. Uh, I think overall, I, I just thought they switched it too much. There were way too many mismatches that just ended up dominating the Knicks defense. So. Maybe try to hedge and recover. I would prefer the hedge over a switch as much as they were switching it. You know, I think it was a little too much. Uh, maybe you try going to Precious more. Because Precious came in last night. Tibbs expanded the rotation to, to eight or nine. And he Precious gave them good minutes. I thought he had a solid first half and did a nice job on MB. The one thing Precious is that I heart and Mitch are not is he's disciplined defensively. He's not going to foul you. Like those guys will. You know? God, it was tough. It was tough watching that defense. They, they just <laughs> literally allowing points. Um, so that's my first takeaway. I want to talk positive, And this will probably be the last thing we talk about because it's going to be a quick episode. So I want to talk about Jalen Brunson's bounce back night when we return from our first break here. On BD4, stay with us. Episode 672. Hey there. Thanks for listening in so far. If you enjoy this episode, please give us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're on YouTube, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks so much. You can follow us on social media as well. On Instagram, we're at BD4Pod and at Rob J. Carbone. On X, we're at BD4Pod and at RJCBD4. And on Facebook, we're BD4. If you're interested in our website, just go to www.bd4blog.com. 
you can subscribe to our blog on there right on the front page. Just like on the podcast, we cover Yankees, Knicks, and MMA. Also on our website are the links to the different platforms for the podcast. Thanks so much. Okay, welcome back to the show, episode 672 of the podcast, the Knicks drop game three in Trashy Philly. The one positive of the night, uh, we don't hand out game balls in losses in the playoffs, but the one positive of the night was the fact that Jalen Brunson showed the Knicks he's still Jalen Brunson. Um, You know, two games where he shot horrifically, it's ironic they lose that game. they lose the one game where he shoots effectively and efficiently. Um, but I, I think obviously he's key going forward. You gotta keep him going. And I liked how the Knicks were able to generate good looks for Jalen in this game a number of ways. Um, first of all, he it seemed like uh, he didn't share the floor with Josh Hart as much. And when he was on the floor with Josh, they had Josh Hart on the weak side corner a lot, right? And they had OG on Anobi one pass away in the slot to remove strong side help when Brunson comes off, pick a roll, and he's getting downhill. So I thought that was very key for spacing reasons. Um, Speaking of spacing, one of our keys going into this game, using the empty side. And I thought the Knicks used the empty side effectively again. For They've really done it all series when they get Jalen Buckets. A lot of it comes on the empty side. In the first quarter, late in the period, they ran an empty side pick and roll with Mitch to get Jalen the open lane. Late in the third quarter, Jalen Brunson clears out the right baseline to space out the drive. He gets the lane. So... I thought that was key. Another thing we talked about heading into the series was getting Brunson some off-ball looks, off-ball sets, and the Knicks ran a Chicago set for him. That's a down screen into DHO early in the second quarter. They had Boyan set the off screen. Mitch with the handoff. Brunson gets into an ISO, knocks down the jumper over Lowry. Um, Obviously, getting him downhill versus the drop coverage, that's key. I thought last night Brunson did a nice job getting downhill against the drop, um, rejecting screens when the Sixers tried to force him one direction, using space that he's given off the drop to get downhill and attack. I thought he did a nice job attacking space, and and Embiid's not going to come up and defend you, so Brunson took advantage of that. Uh, And then getting him, you know, spot-up looks in transition. Listen, he, you know, in the first two games of the series, he rarely got spot-up looks. Um, And it's really been a problem ever since Randall went down, not having his gravitational pull on the post there. Brunson's not getting those three-point looks in catch and shoot. But I thought the Knicks did a nice job getting in transition to open up those three-point spot-ups for Jalen. And you saw a few of them in this game. Uh, I think once at the start of each half, he was in transition and he got some open three-point looks. So... I thought that was key, and that helped Brunson score 39 points on the night. Also had 13 assists. He shot efficiently from the floor. Two-pointer, three-pointer, free-throw line. He looked good everywhere. Uh, Again, just late in the game, I didn't like some of the offense from him. I think that's it. I'm going to keep this one short. Yeah. I don't know, man. There's just not much else for me to pick apart. Um, If I have the time tonight, maybe I'll just delete this recording and do a whole full breakdown of this game like we usually do, analyze it for 40-plus minutes, but I don't know what else to say. You know, I think the Knicks will win this series. Uh, I think Philly is very weak, very soft, and I think the Knicks are going to take full advantage of that, whether that be... Five games, six games, seven games. Well, I guess it can't go five now. It can go five, yeah. Whatever it is, I, I still think I still think they win the series. I think tomorrow or 
tomorrow, Sunday, is going to be very large. That's a massive game for both sides. Think if the Knicks take Sunday, order your, you know, T-shirts. You're, you're, I don't know if you're ordering a T-shirt of a first-round victory, but if the Knicks take Sunday, just be, be as cocky as you want. Troll the Sixers on social media because the series is over. It's over. If they win Sunday, it's over. If the Sixers take Sunday, I think they have a good shot at taking the series. But the good thing is the Knicks are back home for three games. So I think the Knicks are taking it. I don't think there's any way the Knicks lose to these losers. Um, I don't, I'm not impressed with this team. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. Sunday's huge. I would like to end this series, uh, at least mentally, on Sunday. So with that said, we're going to head to our final break and then wrap this up with our trivia. Stay with us. Be right back. Studio 69 Productions is a podcast production agency created by Leo Rodriguez to allow content creators to market their podcast. It's an online platform that will market your podcast or any other project that you're working on. Get in touch with Leo Rodriguez from Studio 69 Productions. You can find Studio 69 Productions on Instagram at Studio69NJ. Studio 69 Productions, where dreams are heard and born. Thanks for listening to BD4, where there is no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA, Yanks every series, Knicks every game, and MMA on occasion. Welcome back to the show. Let's wrap this thing up. Okay, well, that was the wrong fucking... That was, that was the wrong graphic there. I had the Yankees one still up. Um, let me see if I can get to our trivia real quick. Uh, I rushed this. I rushed this. Clearly. Busy day. I got finals coming up. Um, okay, here we are. Episode 672, our trivia question. Who holds the Knicks record? For 36 rebounds in a playoff game. Who holds the Nick record for 36 boards in a playoff game? That's it. Appreciate you all tuning in. Episode 672 in the books. Thank you all. I'll see you 673. Later. This episode was brought to you by Anchor. Hey there. If you stayed the entire way through, we thank you immensely for it. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and that you come back for the next episode real soon. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, download these episodes, and share them with your friends as well. BD4 is a five-star podcast simply because of you, and we'd like to keep it that way. Have a wonderful day. Go Yankees and go Knicks!